<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the CEU Executive MBA Vienna Open Day, live from CEU Campus Vienna. My name is Thomas Lamel. I'm the Senior Program Manager of the Executive MBA, and I will guide you through the evening. We will start with the program presentation, and thereafter, you will have the chance to meet current participants and alumni. Then, Professor Tommy Lee will deliver a very current research presentation on shadow banking, is it out of control? If you have any questions, please shoot them in the chat box and I will collect them for the Q&A. So let's start with the program presentation by Professor Maciej Kieślowski. Professor Maciej Kieślowski is CEU Executive MBA Faculty Director and Associate Professor of Law and Public Management. He's got a JSD from Yale, an MPA from Princeton and an MBA with distinction from INSEAD. He's advisor to governments, international organizations, and businesses dealing with political, regulatory, and compliance issues. His book, Administrategy, translated in five languages. Maciej, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Thomas, and warm welcome to everybody. Um, it's amazing to be here on campus, uh, and it's... Uh, mm, we are particularly happy that with the vaccination program here in Europe, we are slowly moving towards, uh, towards normalcy. Uh, but make no mistakes, the, the challenges that this uh, COVID pandemic has brought are very real. Uh, they are coming in a context of many uh, broader transformations that happen in the world. Uh, and, uh, and were happening even before we started uh, with, this, with this incredible and, and very tragic year. If you think about it since 2009, uh, over the last 11 years, we had uh, the largest financial crisis in, um, since the Great Depression. In Europe, we have currency crisis, then we had a refugee crisis, one of the largest refugee crises in Europe in decades. Uh, and now we are in the middle of this pandemic, which is rivaled in you know, recent history only, maybe by the 1918 uh, pandemic, uh, more, more than a hundred years ago. So um, just one decade, and so many changes, so many challenges, so, mu so much volatility, so much unpredictability. What does it mean for management? Uh, what, what it means for management is that management is becoming complex, more complex than perhaps ever before. Um, apart from these broad trends, you, you have uh, a lot of um, other uh, changes. Uh, COVID brought and highlighted digital transformation, but it was going on for, for a long time. Uh, you have strategic changes uh, towards more agile strategies, maybe even questioning whether the notion of sustainable competitive advantage is still relevant, uh, products as, and as service, um, industry convergence, uh, internally learning cultures, the move towards more flat organizations. If you think about it, the technological challenges, the, uh, the, the challenges in, in macroeconomic and social, political, even as we can see, epidemiological and um, environmental environment of business, but, but also uh, challenges in our perceptions or changes of our perception of what good business should be, um, the uh, uh, drive towards more purpose-driven uh, business, uh, the Me Too movement and its impact on on professional world, um, the 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 ever growing uh, intersection between business and geopolitics, all of this, all all of those trends are complex and they come from a variety of disciplines and fields of knowledge. So uh, you would think that they call for even more importance of education, uh, and indeed. Um, because partly because the uh, business is, is becoming more dependent on knowledge, uh, we are seeing uh, more and more demand for um, a, a business education for MBA programs, which in turn is driving the 
cost of those programs up. And, and that actually brings an interesting paradox, which is the increasing discussion of whether MBA is still worth its ever-growing price. It is a paradox because you would think that if knowledge is more and more needed, uh, the answer to this question will be obvious, and yet it's not uh, always obvious, and serious commentators are raising those issues. Um, now, how to deal with this paradox, the need for knowledge and the unsustainably high costs of business education? Well, there are mm, mainly two responses to this, mm, to this tension. Uh, that we are seeing. On the one hand, you can say there is something that we can call MBA in your city. In every, almost every major hub, if you live in a, in, in a major metro area, you will have a, a leading local program that is uh, catering to the uh, audience, mainly from that metro area. And this MBA in your city is a response to the, to the challenges and the tensions that I uh, highlighted uh, because it uh, offers a, a practical, a reasonably affordable uh, solution uh, where you don't need to interrupt your work. It's usually an evening or a weekend program. Uh, the, the, the tuition is manageable. There are no costs related to travel because it's in your metro area. But those convenience factors come at a cost. Those local programs uh, usually have a pretty standardized curriculum. Uh, and also they have a very strong local uh, center of gravity in terms of faculty. It's mostly local faculty and also in terms of students. Logistically, it's very easy to imagine that the program that requires you to attend every second or third weekend is very difficult uh, to attract people from outside a given metro area. So that's one response to that challenge. The radically different response uh, on the kind of other end of the spectrum is uh, what we can call the leading business schools, uh, usually in North America which ask you to move, usually for two years, occasionally for one year, uh, to leave your workplace, leave your country, move your family, relocate. Um, they are significantly more expensive. We are talking definitely uh, six figures, um, 120, 150 even more uh, uh, in terms of tuition and expenses. And then doesn't, of course, even take into account lost earnings because of being out of the market for a year or two. Now, they do give you a significant value in return for all this investment and sacrifice. Uh, they are much more differentiated um, because they don't uh, are not tied to a single metro area. They can be a much more mission-driven, uh, unique, uh, bespoke, uh, 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 products, curricula, especially, but in general, the, the 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 culture or the vision of an institution. They have a widely international student body, and they have they attract global faculty with top credentials. Uh, one of the most important things, which is subtle and not easily definable, but perhaps the most important from my experience is this idea of campus experience. Uh, that it, there is this unique um, learning experience beyond the content of the lectures that is uh, very much defining your MBA at those leading business schools. So uh, see you as an institution, uh, what we recently, uh, celebrated our 30th uh, anniversary, was created initially in Budapest, now in Vienna, with a purpose of kind of bringing the best of both worlds here. And our EMBA for the open world, the CU Executive MBA, is truly 
best of both worlds. Um, we we are uh, uh, kind of very much in an American spirit of a of a of a vibrantly international um, uh, uh, institution with lively campus life. Um, we have students from over 100 countries this year alone. Um, we have. Uh, we are proud we, uh, about our faculty. I'll give you a few examples uh, uh, shortly. Uh, we are a magnet for top faculty who want to work in Europe in an American uh, academic environment. We are very much a differentiated institution in terms of culture, in terms of vision. The EMBA for the open world, we are going to um, talk about that mission too. Uh, and all of this is available and uh, and possible at an unprecedented, uh, subsid highly subsidized uh, tuition of just twenty five thousand euro for the entire program, and uh, delivered in a modular program that gives you this campus experience, but without work interruption. So. Let me uh, dive into some of those uh, some some of those amazing features of CEU and of our program. Let's start with the faculty. As I said, we are a true magnet for top level faculty who want to live and work in Europe, but enjoy American uh, um, academic American style academic environment. An example. My colleague, Professor Miklos Koren, the head of our data analytics team, um, Harvard PhD, one of the uh, leading, uh, one of the thought leaders on big data and artificial uh, intelligence will, will, will teach um, your data class uh, if you join. Uh, my my uh, other distinguished colleague, the uh, head of our unit, uh, Professor Yosef Akbar, uh, business strategy, uh, have taught in more than 40 countries, advises Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I, Susan Hughes, our colleague in marketing, um, uh, especially focus on, on brand management uh, uh, and also personal branding, which a lot of participants find useful. Uh, Professor Mark Kaufman, another Harvard uh, PhD colleague, uh, um, who teaches uh, microeconomics for us, uh, the core course uh, in microeconomics. Uh, uh, again, an important voice in the field. Uh, Professor Austin Lee Nichols, uh, leader, of our, leader of our leadership program, uh, a, a psychologist, uh, again, distinguished uh, researcher in the field. Uh, Joy Chan, uh, our uh, uh, one of our finance faculty, uh, a, a person who, generation after generation of our students say, is just uh, unique and unparalleled in terms of being able to explain finance to people without finance background. And for uh, more advanced uh, colleagues in finance, uh, Professor Adam uh, Zawadowski. Uh, Princeton PhD, uh, extensive experience, and and again an important voice of complex on complex investments. Uh, Mike Labelle, uh, our co uh, lecturer in the innovation and entrepreneurship uh, class, Jean Monnet chair in EU innovation studies, prestigious chair, speaks for itself. To all of that, uh, full time faculty, we actually also are a a magnet for distinguished visitors who want to add this experience of teaching at CU to their teaching portfolio. And some of the people who, with whom you would engage, uh, if you join Professor Christian Silos from Stanford, co-teaching innovation, Professor Miklos Savary from Columbia Digital Marketing, Professor Omar Hernandez from Berkeley, uh, teaching operations, Professor Hui Chen from Zurich, um, uh, teaching control, uh, our version of accounting, more managerial, more executive version of accounting. Professor Mikolova uh, from Behavior Smart uh, teaches uh, consumer 
behavior, an elective in consumer behavior, just a, an example or a set of examples of our uh, visitors uh, who, 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 who fly in to contribute to the program. Speaking about the program, that's the program. As I said, what really distinguishes CU Executive MBA is this ability to um, deliver this unique campus experience in this modular format. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's truly, uh, as you can see from the slide, it's, it's, it's truly doable, even if you are a few hours away. Flight time, uh, it's nine modules, 24 months, so every three months, once a quarter, you either fly in uh, to Vienna or Budapest. We have three modules in Budapest, uh, six modules in Vienna. Or you actually have an opportunity to join online. If you can't travel on a given module, if, if it's more convenient, also with the pandemic, um, uh, I will talk about it, but our classrooms are fully digitalized so we we can also welcome you online and we have good tools to keep you engaged and make it and make it valuable um, an additional thing that you may notice from this chart is uh, the, uh, our smart scheduling uh, most of our modules uh, piggyback on popular european holidays november 1st may 1st so these are long weekends so if you have, let's say, a nine-day module, Saturday to the following Sunday, and there is a you know, May Day in the middle of the week, that week we all know in countries that, uh, that, that, that celebrate that particular holiday, Labor Day, International Labor Day, is kind of always a low a week. And in addition, we have the summer modules, which are, which are uh, in a very weak uh, or a very low season in the middle of August. So uh, participants find it much uh, more convenient to devote uh, a week. Again, this is nine days, two weekends plus a week uh, on three consecutive summers. You start with the summer module and you finish with the module two years later. Uh, when you finish uh, uh, your degree, you don't fi you don't finish the story with CU. You are a lifelong member of our community, um, and this is a community of eighteen thousand um, professionals all around the world, um, uh, alumni in uh, one hundred forty plus countries, um, more than eighty national chapters, country chapters, city chapters. There is a very lively community that. Uh, that 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 you will be part of. We are we we recently started undergraduate program, but for the last thirty years we've been exclusively graduate institutions. So you have all those uh, alumni, so those eighteen thousand people visible on this map uh, are actually professionals in a variety of fields with whom you can engage, but also who are just good. Uh, um, loyal, tightly knit uh, community uh, that is diverse, that is that is fun to interact with. Now, I spoke about the program, I spoke about the faculty, I spoke about alumni, I, I already showed you uh, this slide, uh, which kind of explains how all of this is possible. How is it possible to have this unique community, this unique institution, this unique uh, campus experience. And then, you know, all, also how is it possible that it costs just 25,000 euro, which is so much less than, uh, you know, even local programs uh, around uh, Europe, especially in Western Europe. Well, you know, basic answer is uh, our funder. Uh, Mr. George Soros, who uh, funded this institution 30 years ago uh, and since then supported it with enormous generosity, just a few recent gifts um, on top of our half a billion 
your endowment, another 700, three quarters of a billion to help us move from Hungary, as some of you may know, um, Hungarian government, uh, severely limited academic freedom. And in response to this, we decided to move our uh, seat to Austria while retaining the Budapest campus with which you, from which you can benefit by joining the summer module. Uh, um, to support this transition, our founder uh, helped us with additional funding and, and on top of this, see you a co-founding institution of the Open Society University Network, which gathers prestigious universities from around the world with another uh, seed fund of, of a billion dollars. Uh, all of this, uh, you know, it's not to just brag about uh, large figures. It's, it's, more, about, it's more, more about to to tell you about the spirit of this institution. This is not, um, uh, you know, uh, by any means a for-profit um, uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, we are in a business of supporting leaders of tomorrow uh, like you uh, uh, for education that is accessible, that is reasonably priced, that is not going to burden you with a lifetime of debt, but which is transformational and which truly brings you from dysfunctional to strategic level in your career. We do it because this is in line with our mission. Uh, open society uh, is uh, a concept uh, initially uh, developed by uh, Karl Popper, actually Austrian uh, philosopher of science. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, well, it means intellectual openness. In, in, it means skepti skepticism towards dogmas, hierarchies, privileges taken for granted, truths and pronouncements. It means radical rationality, the idea that when you come to uh, see your classroom, you don't have, uh, you know, like in, especially in this central European German uh, world, you don't have professor, doctor, doctor, you have Maciej, you have Josef, you have Adam, and you challenge every idea that is presented and you discuss sometimes vigorously um, with, uh, with respect, but but also with uh, with passion. Uh, we believe in facts and arguments. That's why we emphasize so much data driven decision making. That is part of open society. Not to follow uh, tempting narratives which are often false, but to follow facts and arguments. We we believe in diversity, not because of some shallow political correctness, but because that is a source of an interesting um, conversation, a, a interesting intellectual exchange that can push you outside of your uh, comfort zone, which is what you need from a good uh, mid-career program. And we also believe that we are training you not only to uh, um, uh, help you um, uh, increase the, con the, 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 the size of your bank accounts, but also to create um, positive change in the world. And we, we, we do believe that managers have this very, very strong uh, power to act as positive change agents. The classroom, how does it look like? Well, welcome to one of our classes here in Vienna. Uh, you have on the picture another one. Uh, but of course, it's not the room, although the room is the, the rooms are very nice. But the community, the people who are inside the room, 65 managers, 14 years work experience, uh, average uh, um, in the last class, nine years uh, leadership experience, three years minimum. It's immersive, it's modular, it's intensive. Uh, it combines high-level strategic topics with uh, uh, with those more uh, quantitative uh, uh, training in finance or data and our proprietary leadership program. And it's very interactive, uh, covers all the main areas, but with this very specific twist 
that we almost every class that we that we teach is kind of tailored to more senior people and uh, more experienced people uh, to that because the experience is not the room uh, you can have that experience also in an online format and uh, you know our state of the art technology I am surrounded here by studio, studio grade microphones. Um, uh, you know, uh, if if there was a, a team a crowd of, of of participants here, you would be able to hear everybody here, whoever uh, um, uh, 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 contributes to the discussion. Uh, quality cameras, uh, large screens. That's why I wanted to. Uh, speak to you from from this room so that you can see that you can participate in this uh, experience online if you cannot attend a particular module we also as with everything we do uh, we, we we make sure that we uh, kind of pay attention to those little details um, for example uh, we send all our participants those very helpful virtual backgrounds, which include their names. Uh, that way, the discussion is much easier, even for our visiting faculty who may not know you at the beginning th that well. So whether you are in class or online, you are part of the discussion. And you know, beware, because the faculty will also cold call people, whether they are in the room or the, uh, or, or join uh, um, uh, online. With everything we do, we have a very low, one of the lowest in Europe student faculty ratios. Um, a lot of uh, staff for a small institutions that we are. We are. We have just one class of 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 those sixty five to seventy five uh, uh, students embass a year. Uh, so this is not a large factory where where you are a little cog in a machine. This is uh, this is a much more personalized community and personalized experience. Uh, once again, twenty five thousand euro is the tuition for the entire program. You pay in free installments. Um, if you uh, participate online, uh, you can do it at at any point. Uh, but if you travel, which we still encourage, if it's safe uh, and and possible. Mm, uh, we offer discounts with our airline partners and hotels in Vienna and Budapest. So um, all in all, uh, join us. Uh, June 6 is the deadline. Uh, there is still time to, uh, to apply. Uh, and uh, I think I've been talking too much uh, because uh, the real story comes from our students and alumni who are joining us today and we are very grateful that they are here so thank you so much and we will be i will be happy to answer questions later in the in the evening thank you very much Marce, for the best transition ever let's move to the part where we are talking with the current participants and alumni because it's one thing to hear from us about the program but it's another thing to hear about the program from people who have actually done the program or are in the program actually so um, the first guest of tonight is Alex Braumann. He's um, in collaboration, global sales and route to market at Cisco, and he's current participant of the uh, current cohort. And um, Alex, please just briefly introduce yourself and tell us something like where and um, why did you choose uh, CEU back then? And what's your impression about the degree so far? Okay, thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Alex Braumann. Uh, I'm I'm an I'm an Austrian um, working in Cisco for 20 years now. So I'm a very long track record. Let's say you know working in a in a global organization, and um, with uh, all all the craziness that happened at Cisco, I and, and kind of all the invest that Cisco is doing in this organization, I was looking for something that um, kind of 
let's say it opens my horizon. That's something what I wanted to say or what, what, I, what I was looking for when I was looking around for what kind of mid-career, what kind of development program you can do outside of a, of, of a world where you would, 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 would say you get a lot of opportunities, you have a very fast pace, you get a lot of education within a global organization. So what is of value, you know, if you want to look outside of that? And what was interesting for me is, when I found out or when I learned about the way the CEO EMBA program was structured is that I really liked on, on the diversity. So for me, it was kind of the, I kind of, let's say, call it a bubble or whatever, but it, it, it was a bit my, my world within, the, within, within this, uh, let's say, IT industry environment within Cisco um, was kind of... Uh, allowed me to, to get to a lot, to work with a lot of great talent and a lot of great people. But I wanted to kind of explore that there is more. And what I really liked, and this is kind of worked out, I can say really good after one and a half year in the program, is that the diversity in the group of the others, that you get to experience, you know, all the education, all this joint education uh, with someone, you know, out of the NGO sector, of cultural sector, which I must admit, I wouldn't have met, you know, in where I am now. And this kind of, this, usually you always say, you know, it's super fruitful to, to, to work together in this diverse environment. But I can say, okay, I, I wanted to explore it more and this helped me a lot and this was a big reason in the beginning for me to go in that direction i assumed that the level of education and the level of the program will be, will be similar but this was what i was looking for and i'm very happy that this worked out pretty good so that's a bit my story and where i'm coming from then. don't get me wrong i'm not i don't want to patronize you but i do have the impression that you got what you were looking for because i mean speaking of the diversity of the People coming from the IT side of you, that people who stepped out of their bubble and their, but there's also people coming from the engineering, there's people coming from entrepreneurship, people coming from culture, arts, um, economy, business, uh, NGOs, public administration, also human rights activism. So I think, I mean, the diversity is not an, not an, an empty catchphrase for us. I mean, it's a fact. So I guess you you uh, received what you were looking for so far. Definitely. So this was ex asset. I mean, it was what I was looking for after one and a half year and also experiencing, you know, in these crazy times now, all the different scenarios, how you work together, either in teamworks present you know and i i was luckily enough to be able to attend a couple of in-person workshops where we did a lot of this group work i was luckily enough you know to also luckily but i also experienced it in a pure virtual environment in a hybrid environment and therefore i must say you know it's kind of this getting this group work together getting this done getting to experience exactly that that was so that I, yeah, I, I must say, as you said, it's kind of, it's, that's, that really worked out very nicely. Yeah. We had a question from the audience for you um, with regard to the amount of homework. Uh, and, um, I, I quote, be honest, do you have enough to do to read, write, prepare, etc.? So can you tell us something about the preparation period and what you do in class? The amount it just is just the homework piece. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's a good balance between what you need to do on site, what you create together with the team, and where you need to go through. I must say, for me, I, I found it kind of okay balance. You know, it's, you also don't expect that you only will go through by attending the lessons and don't study anything. I, I must say, I'm not that smart. You know, I needed to do some study afterwards. But, but nowadays with the material you get with then the way, at least for me, you know, how you get preparation stuff, how what you need to, 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 to learn and to what extent and what to focus on and also the interactivity with the professors and the openness about 
what's important, what are you looking after. That's one piece that worked out pretty good. On the other side, I mean, the teamwork things a lot depends on your teammates, you know, so make sure you get the right teammates in your team and, you know, and kind of help out on that, you know, because that's a big part as well. But also there, we managed pretty good in finding an okay cadence for everyone. It's a bit, you know, yeah, but I'm very used to just having the different time zones and finding slots, you know, where you worked that out. Uh, it's hard to be honest, but what's the amount of time? I can't say it was different for the different models for me. You know, I was more able in summer to squeeze a little bit more packed in to work on that. And now, yeah, it's a bit more, it's a couple. I think for me, it's now, now, now in preparation for the module we have next week, particular because Machi is asking a lot for his module. I, I would say, I'm, I'd say if I'm not saying anything wrong, but I would say it's about an hour <laughs> a day. <laughs> for two weeks, I, I try to to read that, and do this in, in in the right way, uh, which is kind of okay for me on on, on the side with my on my job now. Let's see how it looks after the preparation and after the statement now. But <laughs> <laughs> I think it needs to be emphasized. You know, an executive MBA is not a kindergarten or elementary school, so we are not you know checking what you've done for homework. It's you know it's re self responsibility. It, depends on the amount you are willing to invest is you know the amount that you're getting back from the program so the more you invest you know academically and, and intellectually the more you get out of the program and then it's up to you what and how much you want to take out of the program and that's just one thing i want to add is um, you've talked about the academic excellence you've talked about the interaction with with your teachers but for us for ceu um, education and teaching is not just a street, it's not a one-way street from, from the teacher to the student. It's a, it's a street also from the student to the teacher, vice versa. And it's also a learning experience among the participants. So, I mean, you have to, you know, listen to your participants. You have to react. You have to debate to your participants. It's, it's not just about listening to a teacher. It's all, it's all about interaction and learning from people. Um, but you've uh, emphasized that. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Alex. I would like to uh, move on to our alumni who joined us for tonight. Thank you, Alex. Um, our next guest is Anna Subitska, an expert in digital technology management and Internet of Things. Um, Anna, maybe you can tell us um, about your background and um, why you chose uh, CU back then. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would say the first instance I selected CU uh, as a truly international uh, university with um, American spirit in the heart of Europe. I liked a lot the philosophy of CU, which is built on open society, I would say um, um, dialogue, which is like peer-to-peer um, -peer dialogue between students and, um, and faculty and professors and um, a really rich um, pool of participants. Um, my group was, was very strong. My group was international and um, I enjoyed this um, uh, group networking, um, which was also really important besides uh, the knowledge which we have received in the classroom. We had opportunity to enrich uh, our experience by communicating um, with each other. Uh, for me, it was also important uh, to have the program which was um, um, built in the way that I was able to combine my work, my job and the studies. And CU program, uh, Executive MBA, um, suited it very well. I, my studies in CU helped me to take a lot of important career decisions. And uh, also it led me to where I am. For me, it's a program with uh, really uh, tremendous value. It was good investment. And I see that uh, this is an investment which was um, fully uh, paid, paid out uh, through the next years of my, my professional career. You perfectly uh, mentioned that uh, CEU is an American university and a university with an American, US American spirit in the heart of Europe. And uh, this is also reflected on the let's say legal level, because CEU Executive MBA offers a US and EU accredited degree. So um, the degree you will be um, awarded with in, in more than two years is both accredited in the US and in the EU. So it basically offers the world to you, wherever you go in the world, um, the degree is, is the perfect um, asset to your career. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you so much. I would like to move on to Bianca, another alumna who joined us tonight. She's a global controlling operations manager at Stoppas Industries. And I would like, to, I would like you to introduce yourself uh, and tell us something about your um, experience with CEO Executive MBA. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bianca, as Thomas said. I'm a Romanian. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm a professional with more than 15 years uh, experience in finance and controlling, uh, working for multinational companies. Uh, currently, I'm working, um, I have a global position uh, uh, in an Italian organization. Um, and uh, why I have, uh, I have chose uh, CEU back then, I'm, uh, I was trying to, to remember um, uh, which were the main reasons. Uh, at the beginning, I've seen it like, uh, I've seen a, an, an MBA program like, a, like an important investment in my future. But why, uh, why CU? Uh, CU was because um, one of the main reasons was the proximity. Uh, Budapest was uh, three hours away from Timisoara, which is my hometown. So it was uh, easy to access. Um, another uh, important reason was the, the large alumni network, which was mentioned even previously uh, with uh, um, many members from different nations. So the international factor was very important. And, and the last but not least, uh, the amazing uh, new campus uh, in uh, downtown Budapest. And now we have an amazing campus here in Vienna and another even more amazing campus to come in 2025 when the campus, when CEU will be moving to the Steinhofgründe in, in Vienna, a completely new urban uh, development area just for CEU. Um, you mentioned the international format of the, um, of the MBA. I just want to uh, highlight to the attendees that we managed to, or the MBA got even more international. We are the second most international university according to the Times Higher Education. And thanks to the modular format, which is you know a modular format that um, with three modules a year on average, it allows people from around the world to actually commute to the program. We have in the current cohort people coming from five continents despite of the Corona crisis. Just, I mean, I think that's incredible. And I, I think it speaks for the program itself. It speaks for the quality and the commitment and the trust people have in, in us and the program. Um, just um, one more question for you. Um, how did it help your uh, career? I mean, you've, um, uh, you're a recent alumna, you've uh, graduated in 2018. Can you tell us about your career development or what you want to get from, from the MBA? Uh, yes, uh, actually um, the, the MBA program helped me in the next step of my career. Um, because I'm still working for the same organization. Um, uh, and, um, but the, the MBA program gave me uh, a better understanding, knowledge, confidence, and even credibility uh, among the top, the, top, the top management and the stakeholders mm -hmm. to, to move to the next step. Um, therefore, one month af after I finished the MBA program, um, I took the challenge and the responsibility of six subsidiaries in the group uh, worldwide, and um, I felt it that in that moment I was already prepared to to uh, to say yes to this to this challenge. Well, I mean, perfect. I mean, it totally makes sense for you and your career. Thank you very much. I would like to move on to the next part to our keynote uh, speech to the research presentation by Professor Tommy Lee. Uh, professor Tommy, assistant professor in the Department of Economics and Business. He's got a master's and PhD degree from the University of Toronto. His primary primary research field is over the counter markets, information and learning and finance. Tommy, the floor is yours. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, joining us in this open house. Um, and today I will be uh, presenting on a uh, recent research of mine, uh, which will talk about uh, so called the dark markets. And we'll talk about what I mean by dark markets. And also the key question of this research would be, 
Should these dark markets be reined in? Should regulators do something about it? So this would be the topic. Now, at this point, I'd like to say that um, the term dark markets is surprising in the sense that they are almost as sinister as what, the, what their name suggests. And you'll see this very soon. So what is a dark market? So first to really think about um, policy implications about what regulators should do, we first have to take a step back and say, well, what are the total options that are available to a trader or an investor today? So if one of the options is a dark market, then of course the alternative would be something like a lit market. And what we mean by a lit market, when in the news you hear certain markets are lit, what they mean is typically they're talking about so-called the exchanges. Exchanges such as you know, NASDAQ or NYSE, these major stock exchanges, or perhaps Bloomberg, which in fact trades swaps, or something like MTS, which trades bonds. So what are these exchanges like? They're sort of like an eBay or Kijiji or uh, Kijiji of financial assets where anyone can come along, they can post uh, that they want to buy or sell, and they can specify the price and they can specify the quantity in some sort of a centralized marketplace. So naturally, these markets tend to be quite transparent. At any given point, you know how much things are being sold and at what price. So if you go to something like Yahoo Finance and you look up a price of say an Apple stock, what you see is not some price that's determined by the government or anything else, but what you see is the price as determined by one of these exchanges. And you can have a single price because these markets are transparent. You know what the prices, at what prices are people willing to buy or sell these stocks in these um, uh, lit markets. And as uh, everything I, I spoke about would tend to uh, suggest, these markets are quite accessible in that anybody can come along, they can post, uh, 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 post whether they want to buy or sell. And if you look at all the different posting and you like a price and you want to buy or sell at a given price that's been posted, then anyone can go to these markets and trade, which means that ultimately buyers and sellers, they trade directly with one another in decentralized markets. Somebody who wants to buy meets directly with somebody who wants to sell. So there is no middleman, there is no intermediaries. Now, these sort of lit exchanges are standing in contrast to uh, what is formally called the over-the-counter market. Sometimes this is described as a dark market. So for me to trade in this over-the-counter market, what do I have to do is I have to go and contact a so-called a dealer, somebody like uh, the Citibank, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, any number of other uh, typically large investment banks who act as dealers for various assets. And how the market works is I have to call one of these banks and ask them, I would like to trade something. I'd like to trade a corporate bond, say. And first, the person that I contact, the dealer, has to give me permission to trade. And then it would be the dealer who then chooses at what price I have to, uh, at what price that the dealer is going, uh, is going to trade with me. So I have to go to Goldman Sachs and I'll say, oh, I'd like to trade some number of corporate bonds. Sometimes Goldman Sachs would say, they don't want to trade. Or sometimes they'll say, I'm willing to trade, but only at a particular price. So naturally, this market, in contrast to the exchange, tends to be quite opaque. At any given time, you don't know which assets are being bought or sold. You don't know how much is available, and you don't know what price you're ultimately going to get. And the second part, despite this uh, example I gave, in fact, these markets are not very accessible. If you're something like me, if I wanted to trade, say, a swap or a particular stock in this over-the-counter, in this dark market, well, I don't even know who to call. I don't have a phone number of a dealer in my phone, right? So I don't know who to call at City. I don't know who to call at Goldman Sachs. I don't know who to call at Deutsche Bank to make this trade happen. So naturally, in addition to being opaque, which is where the term dark market comes from, it's not very accessible to many people. And fundamentally, all of these things are the case because these markets are intermediated. A buyer and a seller 
never trade directly with one another in these over-the-counter markets. Instead, they both trade through a major bank. So all this description and all these negative terminology I'm using to uh, describe the over-the-counter markets would suggest that, well, in reality, you think the exchanges would sort of be dominant. They're transparent. And as we know, they're quite electronic. They're accessible. They're uh, very efficient and competitive, whereas the over-the-counter market doesn't seem to have any of this. In fact, in the OTC market, there's, they can be so, in some sense, retrograde in terms of technology that a lot of trades still happen over the phone. So in the OTC market, in this uh, dark markets, people sometimes still trade by a phone by calling your favorite uh, favorite dealer. So what does the data say? Well, as it happens, the data suggests that almost all the trades are in the dark. This over-the-counter market is around the world, in fact, the dominant one. So if here, if we talk about credit derivatives, which is a class of uh, financial assets that are among the most important in the world, they include things that you may have heard of, for instance, uh, uh, credit default swap or interest rate swap and uh, many uh, FX instruments. So these credit derivatives, if you look at the OTC traded, the dark uh, market traded uh, notional value of credit derivatives, you get something close to $500 trillion. By contrast, if you look at the exchange traded credit deriv uh, derivatives, it's only, well, you know, we're using the term only lightly here, it's only about $70 trillion. And if you were to focus on particular assets, then we find that for swaps, some 96% of trades are in the or in the dark. And for corporate bonds, some 80% is in the dark. And even when you focus on a class of assets that you think would be most traded on exchanges, very liquid, popular, exchange listed stocks, even there, some substantial proportion are over the counter. For instance, looking at US exchange listed stocks, the most liquid, most exchange traded, uh, uh, most uh, exchange traded uh, assets in existence, even for them, some 17% of trades by dollar value are in the dark. And as you move away from the US to less liquid markets, and as you move down the list from these exchange listed uh, stocks to unlisted stocks, you find this percentage going up very rapidly. So the first goal of this research is to provide an explanation for why, despite apparent weaknesses, despite the fact that the OTC market is opaque and it seems quite inefficient in many ways, how can it be that the OTC market can dominate? How is it outcompeting the exchanges? And we have a rather intuitive explanation, which we'll explain by a series of pictures. So let's imagine at start that there's just a NASDAQ, there's just one exchange. And there's two types of traders. One is AIG, an insurer, and the other is Two Sigma, which is a major hedge fund. So if you're to think about AIG and Two Sigma, first thing you notice is that their motives to trade would be quite different. For instance, AIG, well, it's an insurer. So what does an insurer do? Well, they insure other people's risk. They take on the risk that the other people have onto their own balance sheets. So naturally, AIG has a lot of risk that they have to deal with. So probably if AIG, a trader from AIG contacts you or a trader from AIG wants to trade something, this is probably coming from some need to manage risk. It's not really there to make a quick profit. It's there to uh, help deal with their portfolios. Maybe they have, they have a major payout, so they have to liquidate some, uh, some part of their portfolio and so on. And what's, what this really says is that an insurer like an AIG is a fairly safe person to trade with, right? You trade with them and you know that AIG isn't out there to make a profit off of this trade. They're really just trying to manage their own risk. By contrast, if you look at Two Sigma, well, it's a hedge fund. And how does a hedge fund, uh, how, the he how would a hedge fund make money? Well, they make money basically by knowing things that you don't. 
So they will tend to buy when the price is too low, and they'll tend to sell when the price is uh, when the price is too high. What this means is that whenever you go and trade with somebody like Two Sigma, trade with this hedge fund, then you have a good chance that you're going to be ripped off. Or another way to put it is you're going to have a good chance that you might lose some money on that trade. So we can call uh, Two Sigma toxic in the sense that the tr whenever you trade with them, you might lose some uh, you might lose some money. You have a good chance that you'll lose some, lose some money. So what happens in this case where both AIG and Two Sigma are just stuck in an exchange? Well, if you think about something like eBay or really a stock market, you cannot pick and choose who you trade with. You post a price and some quantity, and whoever gets there next, it could be AIG, it could be Two Sigma, but in any case, whoever gets there next gets to trade with you. You don't get to pick and choose who you trade with at a given price. And so if you're somebody at NASDAQ who's, uh, who might be thinking of trading, well, you know that you could, you have 50% chance of trading with AIG, who's safe, to whom you're willing to give a really good price. On the other hand, you have 50% chance that you might trade with Two Sigma, to whom you're not willing to give a, a really good price because then you might lose money. So to Two Sigma, you give a very bad price. So 50% of the chance you have somebody who you'd give a good price to, 50% chance you have somebody who you give a bad price to. So you might split the difference and say in this exchange with uh, AIG and Two Sigma together, well, you might end up with prices that are in the middle. It's not that bad and it's not that good. Okay. Now let's introduce the OTC market, the dark market. Let's introduce a dealer, say a Goldman Sachs to this. Now in this dark markets, the trades happen in a very different way. AIG and Two Sigma, if they want to trade in uh, trade with Goldman Sachs, they have to contact them first. They have to call them. And naturally, if uh, if Goldman Sachs gets a call from AIG or Two Sigma, they know who they're dealing with. So even before Goldman Sachs has to commit to a price, they learn who they're about to trade with. This is completely different from Nasdaq. So what Goldman Sachs can do is if AIG goes to Goldman Sachs, they can say, oh, we know you're AIG. We know that you're unlikely to, uh, we're unlikely to lose money on this trade. And so we're willing to give you a good price. But then later, if Two Sigma comes, then Goldman Sachs knows, well, you're Two Sigma. You probably know something that we don't. So we're only willing to trade with you at a very bad price. The result is Goldman Sachs will give a discount relative to the exchange to the safe traders like AIG, which would lead to uh, safe traders like AIG being cream skimmed into the dark markets. So Goldman Sachs will offer a good price to AIG and cream skim them away from the exchange while Two Sigma is stuck on the exchange because if they were to go to Goldman Sachs, they'll end up with a very bad price. So the result and the explanation that we give for why these dark markets are so important and so big is that for a lot of traders like AIG who are relatively safe, who are safe relative to other traders, well, they like the OTC market. They receive some discount in the OTC market because in the uh, in these dark markets, the dealer can give you a specific, a trader specific price. They can say that, okay, you're relatively safe. And so I'm willing to trade with you at a relatively good price in a way that you cannot do on an exchange, right? So this kind of, uh, this kind of trading actually helps safe traders like AIG. Now, this is the end of the story. So dark market markets are great because it helps people like uh, AIG. It helps the relatively safe traders. Well, not so much. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise, this uh, paper would be a very short one. Because if you think about it, what would happen as dealers like Goldman Sachs cream skims away safe traders like AIG from the, uh, from the exchanges? As more and more of these safer traders end up going to the dark markets, what would happen to the exchange? Well, the exchanges will, uh, will progressively get worse and worse because all the safer traders will leave and increasingly the worst traders, increasingly the more toxic traders will end up uh, concentrating in these, in these exchanges. So here, after cream skimming has happened, the two traders, the AIG two sigma are separated. 
with AIG in the Goldman Sachs, and, uh, with Goldman Sachs and two Sigma with NASDAQ. So clearly, as we just described, well, Goldman Sachs gives pretty good price to AIG. But then now with just the two Sigma left on the exchange, well, people know that, okay, two Sigma is the main person that you might be trading with on NASDAQ. And so people naturally, everyone in NASDAQ naturally starts ratcheting up the price. They give very bad prices because they're really afraid. Now they have a very good chance that they'll end up trading with two Sigma because AIG is gone now. So the result is having the over-the-counter market isn't just a benefit. This dark markets benefit some people like AIG, but it makes the exchanges worse off and everyone who must trade in the exchange, they end up being worse off. So the result is in fact, it's not so clear that the OTC markets are good. It seems that if AIG, for instance, only benefits slightly from having, uh, having the option of trading in the dark, in the dark markets, but Traders like Two Sigma gets hurt a lot by the exchanges becoming worse. And overall, it could be that having these over the counter markets, these dark markets can actually be uh, can actually be a bad thing. And this is in fact exactly what we end up showing in the paper. What we show is that as the safer traders like AIGs are cream skimmed away from the exchange into these into these dark markets, overall traders become worse off because these people who are, uh, those who are being cream skimmed into, this, uh, into the dark markets, they don't benefit as much as the amount that is lost, the pain that's suffered by those, who end, uh, those that end up staying in the exchanges. Specifically, we find perhaps a surprising result that shows that having the option, giving people the option of trading in these dark markets can make, uh, can make the traders worse off overall, even as uh, it increases tra total trade volume and it improves the prices. So you, if you just look at data, you could actually see that, oh, prices are becoming better and there's more trade volume with these dark markets. And yet, nonetheless, people could still be worse off overall. Specifically, what are the types of assets that our model predicts would benefit the most by banning these dark trading, by banning and closing up these dark trading? And what we show is that assets like the swaps and bonds are the ones who would be, uh, who'd be best off. And if you remember, swaps and bonds are exactly those assets that today we see are overwhelmingly traded in these dark markets. So one of our key uh, policy predictions is that the traders, uh, the, there'll be greatest benefit to traders by closing the, uh, the dark markets exactly in those assets where there is the most dark, uh, dark, market trading, uh, uh, dark market trading that we observe today. And all of these findings helps to justify the recent policies represented by something like Dodd Frank in the US or Mid2 in the EU, if you work in finance, uh, you've probably heard of these two uh, um, regulations quite often. Both of these regulations, in fact, target assets like swaps and bonds to move those trades in swaps and bonds that currently are overwhelmingly in the dark. They want to move these to the lit exchanges as much as they can. Now, many people have opposed this, saying that, well, look, in these markets, they're currently over, uh, people are trading overwhelmingly in the dark. So we should keep it there because maybe there's some benefit. What our model does is our model shows that in fact, just because everyone is trading in the dark, it does not mean that people are being better off. In fact, when, exactly when most people are trading in the dark is exactly when closing, banning dark trading could benefit people the most. Uh, and this helps to justify some of these, uh, uh, these major uh, regulations. And in fact, our paper might suggest that Dodd Frank and MIFID II could be even stronger. Now, we talk a lot about this policy. And the key thing that any research in finance, especially, has to ponder is, okay, you have a model. It's a mathematical fancy model. 
But it's ultimately just based on a theory. It's ultimately, at some level, it's a theory, right? So it would need some kind of empirical backing. Otherwise, there's no strong reason for you to believe anything that you say. So in the, in the case of this research, our paper happens to have uh, what might be a surprising prediction. The model suggests, predicts, that when the prices are the worst on the exchanges, is exactly when the volume on the exchanges would be the highest. And so the amount of trading on exchanges is higher when prices on those exchanges are worse. So, uh, so this is somewhat puzzling in that it, this seems to suggest that traders like to go to the exchanges when they're, going, they're about to get the worst prices on the exchanges. Nonetheless, you know, for uh, intuition that we will not cover now. Nonetheless, this is what our model predicts. And on the right-hand side here, we plot all the most uh, regularly traded, all the regularly traded stocks in the US. So each dot represents a stock. And on the x-axis here is the price. So further up to the right of the x-axis you go, uh, worse, is the, worse is the price, higher is the price. And on the y-axis is the volume on the exchange. So higher on the y-axis you go, the higher the volume on the exchange. And what you see from a very helpfully placed uh, linear fit from a, a line that you see in this plot is that there is a positive correlation between how bad the price is on the exchange and how much people trade on the exchange. People tend to trade more on the exchange when the price is worse than the exchange. And we go uh, several steps further in the paper with using some methods that you might cover in the MBA uh, that shows that uh, through a battery of statistical tests, this positive correlation is quite robust. Um, robust for all sorts of types of assets uh, across time and so on. So what does this mean? Well, given that our model is the only one that can predict this positive correlation between the price and the volume, given that the fact that we actually see this in the data and that this correlation happens to be robust is uh, gives some credence to uh, what our model predicts, what our model suggests for policy. Okay, and this, this is it. And thank you for, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, much I would like to invite you to um, discuss with Tommy. Yes, Th thank you so much, Tommy. Uh, this was uh, a, uh, this was a lovely presentation, very engaging and very you know you co communicate a complex model in a very uh, approachable way. Uh, let's talk like a. Uh, let's talk like a lawyer and a finance expert uh, here. Um, so, first question, uh, Tommy. So, you know, interestingly, you are talking about, you, you, you introduced very nicely this, uh, this dark OTC market, but then you focused on one specific aspect of them, yes, which is uh, the cream skimming. Uh, so one uh, puzzle for regulators that, you know, uh, can be drawn from this is, so, you know, let's assume we don't that much believe your model and your paper. And we do like the fact that, uh, you know, the safer traders have uh, have these other opportunities, it still doesn't fully explain those other features of OTC markets. Yes, you could imagine uh, the, 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 the non-anonymous trade which ma with, with much more disclosure and reporting, right? Uh, What's, what, what are your thoughts? Because, because like, you know, they don't logically must come together, right? So, so, that's, a, uh, so that's a great point. So it's the case that, um, so it is possible for us to, uh, for regulators to spruce up the OTC market in some sense, 
And this is exactly what MIFID, for instance, does, which is, okay, now previously it was completely opaque. People in these dark markets, these over-the-counter markets, they were trading all the time and nobody you know, was knowing what was going on. And now MIFID is enforcing some more of these rules. Now, the interesting thing about our paper is this is a very good point. And we thought of this. And so we we're trying to say, okay, um, we got these results that says OTC market is bad uh, or it could be bad under many circumstances. So, we're, so what we wanted to do is, well, how robust is this? So what we do in the model is, okay, let's make the OTC market the idealized version of it. So in reality, what, is, what does OTC markets have? They have these dealers, Goldman Sachs, for instance, they have monopoly power. You know, they have some market power, so they can bully some people sometimes. And, there's a, and it's sometimes hard to find who's willing to trade in these markets. Sometimes you have to like call many, pe many people, you know, at least uh, according to some conversations we had. Uh, with people in the industry, you sometimes have to contact multiple people before you find somebody who's willing to trade with them. So what we do in the model is we pretend that OTC market is perfect. Prices are competitive. There is no friction. You can always find somebody to trade. There is no inventory cost. We basically make the OTC market perfect. And in even in those cases, we can find that in uh, we we find the same results. That in fact, for assets such as swaps and bonds it might be best, um, at least it would be overall, uh, people would be overall better off if there is, um, uh, uh, if there is a, uh, if this choice of going to these OTC market was withdrawn um, by, for instance, uh, uh, you know, the types of, uh, types of regulations that Dodd Frank admitted to uh, enforce purposes. Uh, that, that, that's 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 a that's a really good point. Let me ask a follow up question. And uh, Bianca, Alex, uh, if you have some questions, uh, you can also ask. And also Thomas, if there is something from the from the audience. I mean, correct me if I am wrong, Tommy. But uh, your paper kind of suggests that you need to make finance boring or more boring to make everybody more better off yes or better off um uh i mean that was kind of the the, the tone of your conclusion i want to uh, uh i want to ask you um you know maybe this is a, a little farther from the core of your of, of your topic but very much i think in line with the spirit of what you are saying so a lot of our participants don't work uh, in finance, but they are constantly bombarded by the likes of the companies that you uh, mentioned with this uh, sort of narrative of, you know, you need to up your game uh, and you need to start, uh, you know, uh, engaging in those more exotic and more complex financial products uh, to, to kind of stay at the competitive edge of, of, of almost any industry, yes? And, and we see from time to time, uh, you know, uh, some uh, sad stories about companies that, that lose from the real industry as yes, from the real economy not the not the financial economy who end up uh, you know doing very badly on some derivative trading or um, you know what is your general uh, um, uh, sort of lesson that you convey or your message you convey to our MBA students should you be worried of complex financial products uh, or, uh, or 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 should we, should you be open to uh, to to uh, to you know uh, to to get more value out of them see uh, that's a very good question and uh, you know uh, since you're in law you probably must have uh, heard of many lawsuits that have happened in say the past uh, decade or so uh, regarding this and it's quite interesting in that, unlike, say, innovations in engineering, where sort of the benefits are sort of clear, you know, you get a better phone, you get faster speeds or something like this. The, some of these innovations in finance is not quite as clear. In fact, uh, in fact it sometimes seems to be that, uh, that these new products are being created almost to, you know, 
as, as a product becomes more complex, people have harder time figuring out what it is. And if people have harder time figuring out what it is, that means that somebody down the line is making more money off of that product. This is just the way it is. If you have a cell phone plan that's very complex, uh, then probably eventually your cell phone company is gonna get more fees from you one way or another. And this is quite similar in finance as well. And in finance, since things are especially complex and the maths are especially complex, um, I think it has to be the case. And one of the things that scholarship, the finance, financial economists such as myself have been doing is in fact to point out that it's not necessarily always great for you to have, you know, just to let the free market reign in the sense that um, it is free market is a great thing, but in some, in some levels, uh, complexity can be taken advantage of by those more in the know um, to basically get the financial equivalent of the surprise fees that you might get in cell phone plans. And this has certainly been the case. Uh, this has certainly been the case. And um, uh, there's, in fact, a large literature that suggests that uh, um, more complex a product, more profits for the bank but lower returns for the people who invest in it. So, uh, so uh, yeah. this, this is... No, th th this is a great point. And I want to, just want to make uh, uh, one comment that the exchange we had uh, highlights for, for, for people in the audience a very uh, kind of two approaches that you will often see in, the, in your MBA program. Uh, Tommy mentioned, you know, the cases uh, of... Uh, you know, lawsuits uh, of of bamboozled uh, companies, uh, you know, uh, who lost money on the exotic products. And it's true, we, we do teach that way. Uh, this is called formally the inductive thinking. Yes, you, you, you have uh, several cases, you draw uh, broader conclusions from those cases. But there are limits to... Uh, how you can reason out of those uh, cases? There is, you know, we always we know uh, the phrase anecdotal evidence, yes, which which we know shouldn't be trusted, yes. Just because there are a few cases, uh, you know, we are told by the press or even by lawyers only the bad stories. Maybe there are many many more good stories, which is why during the MBA program we couple the case studies, the inductive approach with what Tommy does uh, and colleagues like him, which is a deductive approach, which, which is, which is uh, thinking from abstract models and applying them to concrete cases. So an example was Tommy's point about, you know, this fundamental logic that if somebody is, go is selling you something complex, uh, you know, there must be a reason why they are doing it. Yes. Yeah? So that raises a, f a flag. That's a, that's the type of deductive thinking. Yes. It's, it's a type, it's a type of thinking through general models in this case of uh, behavior of actors on a, on a financial market. And on only the two combined, the inductive and the deductive are, uh, 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 you know, make up for a, for a nuanced understanding of this ever more complex business world. So you had a taste of both tonight. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you very much, both of you, for this very interesting uh, debate. I would like to move on to the last part of uh, this um, event, to the Q&A session. I've collected your questions, and uh, let's start with the elephant in the room. What are um, the COVID measures on uh, campus, and are we moving to online education? Uh, uh, yes, so uh, as we as we explain in the um, uh, in the presentation, we do uh, offer an online option, which is useful for COVID, but is useful for many other purposes. There are many reasons one on why on one or another occasion you may not be able to travel to Vienna or Budapest for the module, and you will decide to use your online option. That's kind of a fallback safety rule that also helps you in these uncertain times when we don't know, you know, the vaccination, the variants. I mean, there is, there is no way, um, coming back to what I said at the beginning, 
the last 10 years, we had like four or five major crises. So if you want to wait until there, are no, there is no crisis, you may be waiting forever to get your MBA. And uh, so, so the better approach is simply to create a program which is flexible. Uh, and we think we've, 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 we've been doing uh, uh, relative to our competitors quite incredibly uh, um, well on that front, uh, both with the online option, but also with robust uh, safety measures for people who want to participate on campus. Um, we were one of the first uh, universities in Austria that introduced antigen testing uh, uh, in October. Believe it or not, October was just the beginning of antigen testing. Now it's everywhere, but uh, but at that time, we were one of the first. Now, uh, Nick, uh, as Alex mentioned, um, in five days, we have a, a hybrid module online and on-site. Uh, you know, again, one of the first universities that, that, is, that is doing it. We are doing it safe. We are doing it in compliance with, with all the regulations, but we are uh, we, we will be testing everybody on entrance with the uh, with the quick tests uh, every second day. Um, we are uh, introducing uh, uh, very robust uh, social distancing in in Vienna. It's two meters apart, uh, and also we are because of the online option. We don't. Uh, you know, we 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 can introduce distancing because a, a lot of people choose uh, to stay online. We have, you know, very uh, smooth and well practiced tools. For example, to make sure that groups teams can function in a hybrid way. So each team has its own room on campus, which connects with a dedicated link. Uh, so you know. You, you, you simply go to your team room if you are on campus and you connect with colleagues who are off campus. All of this is to, um, is to basically respond to all sorts of conditions, all sorts of situations that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that our participants may have and will continue to have for months and maybe even years ahead. So I, we don't think you should wait for your degree uh, because we don't know when this is going to be over and what does it even mean that it's over. We need to, uh, we need to uh, um, create a program that is exciting, that is safe, but that also is doable in these unusual times. Thank you very much. What, is, what does the application process look like? Thomas, why don't you take this? Sure. So um, the application usually starts with a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me, which you can book a link that I'm just sending over right now. I will be happy to advise you on your application and your uh, scholarship options. Um, once everything is clear to you, you can start your online application by our website. You can create your profile. You don't have to complete your application in one go. You can work on your application. You can, uh, uh, you're required to upload documents, a cover letter, a CV, university diploma, etc. cetera. Um, in the cover letter, we strongly encourage you to emphasize on your motivation, why you want to um, apply for executive MBA. Um, once um, your documents have been uh, checked and cleared for completeness and uh, eligibility, um, you will be invited for an interview and um, in the interview you will be assessed fixed on a, on a uh, based on a fixed questionnaire um, and um, as soon as the uh, interview is over you will be um, sent your case will be sent to the rector because um, it's a very special uh, uh, tweak at our at CU that it's a privilege that our rector handpicks um, the exec the participants of the executive MBA and um, as soon as we get his approval, um, you will receive your admission decision. And the whole process is pretty straightforward. It's transparent and it's fast. It's just a matter of a couple of weeks until you will receive your uh, decision. Um, Machi, do you want to elaborate on the formal criteria? 
Yes. Uh, we are taking it a difficult way because we don't ask you for GMAT. We believe that as there, is, there are a few things that uh, um, predict uh, the ability to function in a CU EMBA for the open world classroom as badly as being able to ace a standardized test. Um, so, but on the other hand, of course, that means we need to be very careful about the other criteria your uh, career progression, your references, even your motivation expressed in the cover letter, your analytical skills that we assess both for uh, your previous uh, educational and professional record. Make sure that your reference uh, uh, letters mention also your uh, analytical skills, not only the leadership or professional achievements. And then the interview, which is, um, as you will see, pretty interesting and uh, maybe challenging even um it's it's it it, it proceeds and uh, based on a very strict protocol and uh all of this we believe uh allows us pretty well to uh, to to identify as what what i said at the beginning those leaders of tomorrow with real appetite to move from this uh, operational and fu functional to the truly strategic level. Speaking of leadership, what is the importance of leadership in the program? Yes, uh, one thing that you get uh, as part of your uh, EMBA, included in your tuition, is the, our proprietary fully-fledged leadership development program, the CEU leadership program, which is taught over three years, over the entire program. It's kind of like a parallel thing uh, um, uh, that is going on throughout your program. Uh, and, it's, and it's experiential. It's not a lecture. It's not a series of lectures. It's an experience. It's, it involves in-class discussions, uh, teamwork, but also a lot of individual coaching. And it's, it's also, um, I mean, what was visible with Tommy's presentations, uh, that uh, we are very research-driven. So uh, the leadership program, unique thing about it is a lot of leadership development programs are kind of based on some version of pop psychology. Well, not at CU. This is based on rigorous uh, research in organizational psychology, decision sciences. We have a multi uh, anthropology, sociology, um, philosophy. We have a multidisciplinary team of experts leading uh, thought uh, uh, leaders of, 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 uh, of CU who work together to uh, design and orchestrate this, curate this, this leadership experience, which, 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 which is um, an important part. I wouldn't say it's a heart of the program because there are many hearts of this program. Our strategy classes, our amazing finance uh, and data, but it's one of the, the, the CU leadership program is definitely one of the key foundations of this experience. Um, are there any exams and is there a thesis? There is no thesis. Our approach to thesis is called the capstone project, which doesn't ask you to write a, a boring 60 page booklet, but it asks you to apply things that you've learned throughout your uh, executive MBA program into real life. And you actually need to collect a portfolio of those applications, five to be precise, speci in specific categories. Um, there is a, a, a dedicated faculty a member, a, a Professor Labelle, I mentioned him in the presentation, who curates this, who works with you. But this, the, the, our approach to thesis is take those models, taste those cases, as I said, both inductive and deductive, and apply them to real, uh, to real world and show us that 
you have managed to change something, even something small in your organization, in your professional life uh, with what you've learned at CEO. Um, can you tell us about, um, I mean, basically, we, uh, we already talked about the different backgrounds in class when we talked about uh, this issue with alumni and current participants. So I think we can skip this question. Um, do we use action learning to get the message across? Yes, I just, I, I just gave you an example. Yes, the Capstone project is an example, but even beyond that, like the courses very often in involve, uh, uh, you know, applied project based. I, I, I missed the part of the question about the exams. There are a few exams at the beginning, especially in the quantitative courses like finance, but for most classes, it's projects, it's, it's team projects. So I would say most of our learning is action learning. You, 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 you learn through the interaction in your support team uh, and, uh, uh, and through individual projects for classes and then through the capstone. Thank you. And um, looking at the time, I would say we're moving on to the last question, with the, which is for most of the people, the most important question, are there any scholarships available? I'm happy to take this question over, Maciej, if you don't mind. Um, we offer a variety of scholarships. We offer a, an open world scholarship. We, open need, we offer uh, need-based scholarships. We offer map-based, country-specific um, scholarships, which are applicable to specific countries internationally. Um, for example, we have an international LGBTIQ um, fellowship. We have a, a scholarship for uh, professionals with disability, etc. We have a, a fellowship for uh, managers in the United Kingdom, etc. Um, we cannot elaborate on all these fellowships in the open day. That's why I posted the link in for you to uh, book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me, and I'll be I'll be happy to advise you on your individual scholarship in the consultation. I think that's the best approach to talk about your individual uh, scholarship option in private and not in an open day. But to summarize, we offer a variety of scholarships and uh, the financing part should not uh, hinder you from applying. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. It's We're 10 minutes over the uh, expected anticipated uh, time. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Machi. Thank you, Tommy, for joining us tonight. And thanks uh, for the attendees for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. <laughs>